understand that they are innately good, that they have it within them to do what they want to, and especially to do good in business and life. And that really they just need to create the space for that to be able to flourish and, and be all right to just get started on that. Good begets good. The more we do to help others and be curious, the better we can deliver results in business. On this episode of The Creator Community, we learn how embracing the true meaning of naivete can drive better outcomes and improve the business journey for all of us. Check out the show. Welcome to The Creator Community. This is a podcast from book publisher, New Degree Presser, NDP, powered by Manuscripts, Inc. I'm your host, John Saunders. The show is designed to celebrate, elevate, and showcase many of the incredible authors that have published their books with NDP. In the show, we learned about the authors, their journeys, and their books. This year, NDP will cross over 1,700 published authors on six continents and has earned a spot on the Inc. 5000 list for the second year in a row. This is the fastest growing privately held companies in America. If you've ever thought of writing a book but weren't sure where to start or how to finish, visit manuscripts.com to learn more. This is episode 11 of season six, and today I have with me Joshua Berry. He is the author of Dare to Be Naive, which is due out this spring, 2023. A little bit about Joshua. From Bahrain to Bogota, from Calabasas to Catalonia, Joshua has been helping leaders and organizations make space for growth for almost two decades. As a co-founder of Iconic, Joshua and his team help companies with their innovation and cultural change efforts. He lives in Nebraska with his wife, Trisha, and four kids. Joshua, great to see you. Welcome to the show. John, good to see you again. Thank you so much for having me. Excited oh, to be here. The pleasure is all mine. So it's always fun to have, feels like there's so many runners that join this program, and marathon runners, ultra marathon runners, and of course, you've done triathlons. Before we dive into your book, Joshua, I think it's always interesting for people to learn a little bit about your career and kind of what led you to this moment. Sure. Happy to, John. I went to school for international business and Spanish. Thought I was going to leave Nebraska after that, but a local company needed a Spanish-speaking consultant that started a 10-year journey, primarily doing human resources and talent consulting. But it was all under the guise of the idea, what would the world be like if everybody did what they were good at and enjoyed? I got to do a lot of roles there. And that's where I, again, got to spend a time in about 30 different countries, working with everybody from the Ritz-Carlton to UCLA Medical Center to Cheesecake Factory restaurants, where I gained at least 15 pounds helping out their restaurant openings. And eventually got to a spot where I wanted to leave and go into my first startup. Left leadership of that company to jump into my first startup. And it was a great disaster, at least from my point of view. And the fact that we ran into team issues and intellectual property issues and cash flow issues. I put my house up for sale. And eventually I got to a spot as we were pregnant with our fourth child. And I was sitting there saying, well, what do we do next? And luckily, there were other people around me in the startup community who were also trying to figure out what to do next. Uh, that began a couple of years of helping coach startup founders and teams as they were trying to acquire venture capital, enter into startup programs, helped out with a number of startup accelerator and incubator programs around the US. And eventually that led into the creation of Econic in 2015. I love this global perspective. You've developed the uh, bilingual. So do you still use Spanish in some way? I do. I do. Most often now it's in opportunities uh, when we travel abroad with the family, but there are definitely still opportunities where I get to practice my Spanish. That is one of my great regrets in life. I've studied a lot of a couple of foreign languages, never figured out one and got fluent in it for a variety of reasons. But, you know, for those that haven't, you know, I think only something like half of Americans have a passport, Joshua, which has actually gone up a lot in the last few years. Uh. I want to say 10 years ago, it was maybe 25% of Americans. Wow. In the last 10 or 15 years, it's gone up a good bit, but still one in two. What do you think you've learned from visiting all those countries over the years, through both, both personally and professionally? You know, so much of it is empathy for other people, but then also reinforcement of the common connections right that we all have you know i was i remember when i was excited getting to add extra pages to my first passport and and it was such a badge of honor of that i'll also say though that what it did is so much of that travel reminded me how much i loved home and so i still live in nebraska and it gave me not only a great global perspective but also a greater appreciation for a lot of the things that i have here in my own community really appreciate that perspective and that Right. When you get to see these other countries, you see that 
these folks are humans too, right? They wake up, they eat breakfast, they have lunch. It might not be the same meals and things that we eat or <laughs> wear the same clothes or do the same things, yeah. but I always appreciate traveling. And that's a, a great gift. My parents certainly impressed upon me as a, at a young age and helped me think about and not be afraid to go see the world. So I, I love that you've gained that perspective. Yeah. This program, the author coaching program, Joshua, how did you discover it? And being the busy man that you are, how did you fit it into your life? So it was a complete mistake, honestly, John, of how I stumbled into this. My friend, Diana Kander, was doing a charity auction down in Kansas City and put together a new author package of being a New York Times bestselling author herself. She put it together a package of help somebody become an author. And she poked me and said, hey, you should win this thing. Because she knew that I'd always talked about writing a book, but I'm not a writer at all. And uh, we bid on the package, ended up winning the package. As I was going through the certificates, it was everything from somebody to help you with a book cover and somebody to do some internal layout and this 20-week course from this Eric guy. And I just went through all the certificates and was pinging people. And through that, eventually got to meet Eric Custer and learn about the Creator Institute, or now the Manuscripts Writer Accelerator Program. And that's really what kicked it off. And honestly, that was all just at the beginning of, of this year, or 2022. So my writing journey was really, really short. And I was shocked that I was able to be able to create a book and have something that's already going to be published this spring. In about 12 to 15 months, it's surprising. Well, shout out to Diana Kander. Thank you, Diana, for uh, bringing Joshua this way. <laughs> And it is mind blowing, I think, for a lot of folks. There's been a number of folks, not many, but that approach this program, and they've been spending two, three, four, five years writing wow. a manuscript and kind of never figure out a way to get it done. And then here, arrive here, and 12 to 15 months later, have a published book in their hands going through the process, the journey. So, Joshua, how did you fit it into your life? Did you wake up early? Did you stay up late? How did that work? It, it was a lot of in-between times. So there's a number of pictures of me sitting at soccer practices with the laptop perched up precariously in the Camry as the kids are doing soccer. There was definitely early morning. I'm also blessed to have a really great team at Econic that was able to carve out space over this last year and allow me to be able to find, you know, sometimes 5, 10, 15, 20 hours a week to be able to devote to this. But I would say it was a lot of in-between times and it was a lot of putting on hold maybe some other hobbies or other things during this time just to be able to dedicate to this. Incredible. It really is fascinating to me how when you get into something like this and you have a lot on your plate, uh, you find how efficient you can really be throughout the course of a day. And I always like to compare yeah. it to sort of when you run a car up to sort of like an NASCAR, seven, 8,000 RPMs or higher. At first, it seems like a bit of a shock, but once you sort of get to that 8,000 RPMs, it just sort of becomes the norm and you can kind of run with it, right? And it's a challenge, no doubt about it. But what pushes us, I think any author from, you know, the, from some of those written five books or one is, is the mission, the why that got them behind their book. Sure. What is the mission behind Dare to be Naive, Joshua? You know, the mission for me is I want to help business evolve, pure and simple. And I think... The amount of time that people spend at work can be used in ways to continue to better themselves, better the people they're serving, better the community, better the environment. And so the mission with the book is really about creating space and an okay space for people to understand how maybe business is evolving, how they themselves as leaders or managers or individual contributors are evolving, et cetera. And I think there's a there's a sub kind of mission that's now, and, and this is, I think this is good to note, is it wasn't a mission at the beginning of the book, but it's come out now as the book has evolved and as I've talked to more and more people about it, is you know a core component to my book is about understanding the beliefs that you hold about people <laughs> and about your fellow human beings and creating space for what's what what you gain and what you lose with your beliefs and that of other people. And so as society, at least as a number of people see more divisions in society, there's a secondary mission of this, of creating space for dialogue across people about here are the things that I believe, here's the things that you believe. How do we come together and appreciate that that diversity is important? When you look across your entire lifespan, right, where do you think this mindset, just, you know, I'm sure it wasn't one moment that turned for you. How do you think this, this why, this mission evolved for you? Where do you think that came from? You know, growing up, we moved around a lot. I think at one count, I lived in about 14 different homes before I was 16. And that need for constant adaptability and change likely influenced a lot of who I am. We talk about a growth mindset nowadays. 
I was constantly needing to figure those things. I also recall a time when I asked my dad when I was younger about why butterflies fly. And I think I was, you know, in elementary school and he said, that's why we bought encyclopedias. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. And that, and a couple of other moments reinforced this, you, you need to reflect and grow and figure these things out. Uh, so combine that with, again, my first 10 years out of school were spent at an organization that believed in the goodness of people and, and human aptitude and ability. And I think those things just came together that like further reinforced this core belief that I have that, that you, John, and anybody else listening to this are innately good and you have potential inside of you. And so I think all of those things have built into it and onto each other and have really led to, you know, what, what's now manifesting through this book. So you've been dealing with pretty radical change your whole life. You said 14 homes by the time you're 16. That's unbelievable. You know, for, especially for somebody who my parents still live in the same house. I was literally born oh, wow. and raised in. Uh, <laughs> so I couldn't imagine 14 times. But now in my own professional journey, I've moved a handful of times, but that's, that's unbelievable. And then of course you had this broader. So that was more of a regional perspective or local, you had this broader perspective, given this, uh, all this global work you did and all the travel that you've done. And I really appreciate you, that you brought this back to these key themes of the power of, of, of understanding that others are good and can do good. And we have to fight this habit we often have of assuming maybe the worst, which oftentimes yep. we do. And, you know, maybe this, I think I've, if I understand it, it goes back to sort of the caveman days of being defensive and projecting negativity, but we don't have to be that way. And I love this global perspective you've gained. And thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. So Dare to Be Naive, the book, how did all of this life's journey turn into this? You know, what's this book about, Joshua? <laughs> Again, for other authors who might be listening to this or starting on this journey, it definitely didn't start there. The original idea of the book was going to be called Evolve. And uh, with E-V-O-L called out, so love spelled backwards. And it was going to be about how uh, more and more what I see of love and specifically the idea of actively caring for the growth and development of other people was was is becoming more and more prevalent and talked about in business. That's what I started with. And it eventually evolved into this spot around naivete. And, and the reason being is because I got some pretty negative feedback from a couple of key people I really admire about where I was going with the book. And when I went back to the drawing board after crying for a couple of days, no joke, I, I, I saw in some of the interviews that a number of the people that were really successful in their businesses and in their entrepreneurial ventures kept saying, you know, this might sound naive, but, and then they shared this amazing truth or business idea or practice or something. And I thought, ooh, maybe there's something there. And that is what kicked off then this whole idea that, Quite often, there are people who have ideas of good or how to evolve or how to grow, but some belief holds them back. And many times, it's a belief around what will other people think and is this in the mainstream, et cetera. And you know, people were using, like I said in these interviews, this might sound naive as a qualifier or as a shield. And I realized I actually did that a lot for myself growing up too. I probably still do sometimes. So they would preface statements with, oh, maybe yeah. I was being a little naive here, but this is what we did. Yeah, this absolutely. That is fascinating. So, and what's interesting about this story for me, and I think for listeners that are thinking about maybe writing a book is one, you had this idea that you came into the program with, as you went through the process, the research, the interviews, talking to other people, you saw how it evolved and certainly the same experience for me as it happened. And so you embraced the process and you weren't afraid to change and maybe be a little naive and reach into something new you hadn't tried yet which is changing and evolving your story. I remember your early title and uh, I really love the richness that it landed on because being naive is so often associated with be being negative. Oh, you're, why are you being so naive about this? You, you shouldn't be here or something like this, right? And so this is obviously something you're a big advocate for being more naive. So why is that? And what are the benefits to being naive, you think, in business? Great question. So, so to be fair, and this gets in very quickly in the first chapter of the book, I help people see that it isn't binary. It isn't your naive or, or pragmatic, for instance, right? Like it's a spectrum. I'm not advocating for so far on the spectrum that you're gullible and you're ignorant or anything like that. All I do is start to help people create awareness around where they're at on that spectrum. And that if you lean more towards naivete, especially if it's intentional or chosen, and that's where some of my research really dug into this, is there is a childlike naivete of wonder and curiosity and awe. 
And then eventually over time, we get told more and more, here's the right answers and here's the way and, and, and all of this mainstreamness happens. But what I discovered with some of the greatest leaders, people that I respect from a, from a wisdom lineage, is there's something beyond that. And we started calling that a chosen naivete or a chosen a second naivete. And it's that thing that incorporates both of those things. So benefits that come from that. Uh, specifically, the book goes down a path of talking about business benefits and highlights a number of stories of people who, you know, the most notable in chapter two is talking about Patagonia and Yvonne Chouinard early on in those days who did a number of things that traditional business would have said was naive, but we're really back to a reflection on what he and his leadership team believed and continuing to choose that and holding the outcomes a little bit looser. And eventually, you know, continuing to have great success, as well as many other stories in the book. So fascinating. So sometimes when we're willing to be a little naive and be, I think, curious is maybe a word I'd put in there. We can think a little bit differently, embracing that sort of childhood mindset that we've always had. You know, what is that? Why is that? And, and thinking about things a bit differently can lead us to better outcomes. You know, it makes me think of the story of uh, Cirque du Soleil, right? When that company mm -hmm. came out who would have invested in a new circus, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. And of course, they brought an entirely new vision of what marrying Broadway and, and the circus together, which is fascinating. And so I really appreciate how you how you thought through that. You know, you've often spoken of yourself as a reluctant thought leader. Josh, what, what is a reluctant <laughs> thought leader? And what, how did you land on that? It's, and so so it's a riff off of, again, Yvonne Chouinard has called himself a number of times a reluctant businessman. And it was because he continued to say, I'm going to do business by my own rules. And, and it probably goes back to me. I'm not a great promoter of myself. And when I see a lot of things that other people do to promote themselves, I'm, I'm less excited about that. And so we're constantly tripping over ourselves, honest, honestly, as a team. And even as we're thinking about the book launch to say, how do we make this as authentic and genuine as possible? Right. We, 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 we don't like to call people leads or targets or, or we're not click funneling thing. Like none of that stuff fits what I'm trying to bring. So, so there's the approach. The other approach is really honestly how the book itself is written. I received a lot of advice and feedback that, you know, the books that sell are the ones that say, here's the five steps to doing this thing. And what I came to feel, what was most authentic for me, was not a book telling leaders what they should adopt next. It feels like we have enough how-to business books, but instead create a book that helps leaders adapt. And so even, you know, I'll say a moment ago, you said about the, ooh, maybe a more negative or, or bad mindset. My book doesn't even advocate to say, don't do that. It, my book just advocates and provides a lot of practical examples and frameworks to say, Okay, cool. If that's your belief, like, where did you learn it? And is it true? And what do you gain? And what do you lose by holding that? You know, just as you said, back evolutionarily, there's a reason why that existed. And we can we can be okay with that. And we can thank it. And we can appreciate it. And we can acknowledge that maybe there's something we lose by going down that path. And so the reluctance in there is 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 probably not only in the promotional side of it, then but about how I'm not saying here's the things you need to think. Instead, I just want to help people critically think. I remember my mom telling me many years ago when I was complaining about something in school, you know, why do we need to learn this? I'm just going to forget it after the test. And she said, what they're really teaching is not about what happened on this day in 1882 or whatever. It's it's how to think. And yeah. I remember after she told me that, that, you know, it really changed my perspective and how I approached school. I was like, oh, this is about learning and growing my mindset, not about memorizing this, that, or the other. And once I made that shift, school became much more interesting to me, quite frankly. And so I, I appreciate that you're taking a similar mindset here, not saying here's the five commandments or whatever. It's it's more <laughs> about how to think maybe differently about this, figure out what your beliefs are and, and build around that. And don't be afraid to be naive once in a while. So in the world we live in today, Joshua, why do you think this kind of book is is needed? We could fill a whole podcast around this one, John. A number of things. One, I think there's a lot, a lot of my day work and for the last 10 years has been in the innovation space. There's a lot of great talent and energy that's going towards innovating on things a lot I'll say is that are nice to have and maybe aren't addressing the world's biggest problems. Uh, so I think the evolution of how and why we do business is important. I believe also that work 
is good and that it is one of the greatest places for people to grow and develop and explore. Somebody told me once it's 80 to 100,000 hours of your life that the you know typical person will spend in work. What that role is and what it could be for people needs to continue to evolve. And the next generations are demanding more of that too. And so businesses also need to respond as to how the workplace changes and shifts. And if not, like the, the next generations are going to evolve that for them and they'll be left behind. Uh, the other thing I think is there there is already a strong movement, and I think these are the people who will most resonate with my book, uh, that are already in the conscious capitalism or stakeholder capitalism, the B Corp or 1% for the planet, the people who are already seeing that business can be used for good. And those individuals you know, are, are the people who I think are most going to resonate with why this is a book that is needed. And um, to the point of why this book is then needed more than ever, we need to help those people see that there's a tribe of other people like them that are out there, right? It helps make it okay if you're going to step into things that are naive. And if you weren't doing it because other people weren't doing it, well, then being able to advocate for and show more examples of that actually happening in the world is good and will hopefully continue to create more momentum normalizing this idea of being naive because there's such great power in it to discover what is possible. So many times we have these limiting beliefs, right? That that keep us from thinking bigger and maybe keep us from executing, which I know is a theme that that you talk about. And, and speaking of that, you know, how do you think this book can really help leaders be more successful in business? Sure. You know, a good part of it is is it will show non-traditional approaches to business and the success that those businesses have had. So for instance, one of the stories highlights Chip Conley, who ended up growing the second largest boutique hotel chain in the US before he sold that and then became one of the mentors to the people who founded Airbnb. And now he's on to the Modern Elder Academy and a number of other great things. But he has so many great stories about those challenges, for instance, uh, pushing his general managers at one point to see how much they could give away in discounted services or free services to underrepresented groups, right? Like that that idea of being able to continue to show how business can be used for good, I think is going to be important. People continue to ask for that. If companies don't figure that out, the consumer will do it for them, right? They're going to vote yeah. with their pocketbook and go buy their goods somewhere else. We're seeing more and more of that particularly in the generations coming up behind you. I think the next thing is the end of the book provides a lot of practical is around execution, you know, because oftentimes people don't get started on these things because there's trepidation or they have to have the perfect approach. But again, what we've learned from some of the best innovators and culture changers is how to just get started. And so those people who will read the book will also get some good techniques about how to just get started and actually understand that oftentimes progress is better than you know perfection in this type of space. You know, when you think about this idea of the inability to execute, and you talked about limiting beliefs and perfectionism, you know, where does that come from, Joshua? And how, how do you help people overcome that? Oh. I think a lot of times those limiting beliefs and perfection, you know, some of it's been reinforced for so long, right? If we go back to school and, you know, being told that there was a right way or this is how to get the A on the test, even early days of management and, you know, the structures that have been created to be able to, to make more of a predict and control sort of space, all of those things have made it so that people are expecting to know, like, how do I do the right thing and not step out of line? So there's a lot of things that are really hard to help people people change through that. What I've seen and what the book helps people do to be able to evolve or move from that is to make space for understanding where they are now and how that's helped serve them and to make space for those new beliefs or ideas that are emerging and then hopefully give them a safe framework to be able to try that out. Now, this is back to where I said that work, I think, is a great place for people to be able to grow and develop. Some of our most successful projects at Econic involve creating innovation labs or future of work cohorts where we're creating safe spaces for people to practice the behaviors they need to grow the organizations and grow themselves. But people need those spaces to be able to practice. Finding the space, zooming out maybe to 10,000 feet or something like that, because it's so easy to get caught up in the day-to-day. -day. I've got to do this this month, this quarter, this year, what have you. But sometimes taking that, that moment to zoom out can really help us deliver better results, deliver better ROI. And speaking of ROI, you talk about not ROI and return on investment, but this ripple of impact. Joshua, what is that about? What is the ripple yeah. of impact? 
So, so again, I advocate for two types of ROI through the book. One is that by doing good in business, it is actually good for business. And I show a number of examples of that. And you are able to generate a very positive return on your investment. But again, Chip Conley and a, and a couple of the faculty members at the Modern Elder Academy introduced me to the concept of another ROI, which is ripples of impact. And that idea that, you know, we really have it within us to create a, the power of, 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 you know, the, the ripples that we want to see, right? And so what I advocate for in the book and, and try to help people see is that the small little actions that they do can start these wonderful cycles, right? That can help create ripples and continue to, you know, hopefully impact other people, whether it's just the people within their homes or their their communities or, or whatnot. There's a great story that I have in the book about a manager named Michael and how I heard about this story is he called me up and said, I have this weird ask. I have a superstar. He's kind of reached his limit of growth I'm looking for some other mentors outside of our company to match him with. And as I heard a little bit more, I said, the person who comes to mind actually works for your competitor down the street. And he thought for a moment and he said, you know what? Yeah, let's make that introduction. And at that moment, I knew, okay, so Michael sees something better. And, and I, I, when I then started writing this book, I went back to him and I interviewed him on that. And, and what I uncovered under Michael was that idea of he saw what he was doing was more of a, a long game. It was ripples of impact. You know, he said basically that I it, the growth of that person was more important than necessarily him holding tightly to I need to have him on my team forever and ever. And so and from a business results standpoint, you know, Michael's department at this engineering firm had one of the highest levels of profitability, highest levels of employee engagement and retention as well. So, so many great things that can happen when you're able to think about those ripples. So he, in this story, you had a client call you up and say, I've got this employee who's kind of hit the limit of his upward potential with us. I need a mentor for him outside the company. And you sent him to another organization. Is that what I'm hearing? I offered. I, so, so it, <laughs> you offered. Okay, Nobody's going to call me for business at all. I, I said, <laughs> I said, here's, here's the person I'm thinking of. And Michael was abundant enough in his thinking to be able to say, huh. You know what? If that other person could help this person on my team, that's okay. And 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 again, in the interview with him later on, so you'll you'll read about this in more depth in the book. He really said one of two things is going to happen here. He may leave, and we're going to be in a bind. But he'll know that I was looking out for his best interest, and everybody else around me will also know that that is what I care most about. Or two, he leaves and he goes and learns something and comes back here. He knows that I trusted him, and he brings back something great to our company as well. He's like, it's it's a win win wherever we go. But it only works <laughs> if you understand like a more abundant and generous belief that you have around how everything works, right? <laughs> and is this circumstance in flight or is this, you know, has it come to a conclusion? It, it came to a conclusion. He's still at this organization and, and yeah, but, but, but again, that's, this is back to, I don't know if that's the right question. I, I, I understand the question, but is that the right outcome or the wrong outcome? Like it, it's beyond asking that even. Right. Like Michael was fine with either of those outcomes at the end of the day. So that is talk about outside the box or non-traditional thinking, right? You actually sent an employee of a client of yours to get mentored at another organization and it ended up, it sounds like helping him in the long run and helping everybody. There you go. Yeah. You know, I, I've seen things like that certainly happen internally where you might take someone and I've actually encouraged uh, coaching clients of mine to do this. where They have a team member who's sort of not quite getting it and finding have, having them sit in a different department for some period of time to kind of learn about the business from a broader perspective. Hadn't thought about sending somebody outside the company. What other <laughs> non-traditional business practices do you come up with in your book here, my friend? Well, and I'll just follow along with that one. Chip has a great example where another hotel operator was calling up and was struggling with the opening of his hotel. And so Chip sent one of his best general managers to go down and help that person for two weeks to be able to get their hotel up and going. And so absolutely, they could be seen as competitors. But where I highlight some of those stories, Chip talked about karmic capitalism, right? Again, this idea, again, of ripples of impact and just being able to put something out there and not holding so tightly to, I need to understand what the short-term thing is going to do for me. A couple of other non-traditional things that I approach in the book. One is allowing your employees to have side hustles. <laughs> another one is loosening your grip on intellectual property and trade secrets. There's another chapter that's dedicated to rethinking growth for just growth's sake. 
And I want to share, but before I you know, share any of those examples, all of those chapters end not in saying, and that's what you should be doing. They all end in saying, cool, what beliefs or, or, or agreements or disagreements did that stoke in you as you were hearing these stories and examples? What does that tell you about your belief about people or business or practices? Where did you learn that belief? Is it true? What do you gain and what do you lose from holding that belief? So it's all meant to be provocative in a sense of stoking reflection and critical thinking more so than advocating. And here's how you manage side hustles while still having a profitable business. Right. Letting people, one, accept or at least say out loud what their beliefs are and evaluating them. Like, does this make sense? Do I still need to hold on to that? Maybe I need to evolve or change this belief. Mm -hmm. You know, that story, This it, it makes me think of this idea of abundance, right? So many times we come to a circumstance in business and and, and with a zero-sum mindset. If I win, yeah. you lose. If you win, I lose, right? And and very much not what's going on here. This is this abundance mindset, which I, which I so appreciate. Makes me think a little bit of Volvo, right? I mean, if you think about Volvo, what's the first thing you think of? And safety, reliability. That is their mission. And I did some reading on them a while ago that my son sort of inspired me to do a long story on that one. But they have completely open sourced their research and work on creating cool. cars to be more safe. They've shared it with everybody for free. Why? Because their mission in life is to make cars safer and make all of us live better lives because of that, which is incredible and very much a, a tie in here, which I appreciate. 100%. Great example, John. Thank you. So growth mindset and being emotionally intelligent are so important for leaders. Like, how does your book help people develop or think about these things maybe differently? Sure. You know, the growth mindset one hopefully is obvious by this point in our conversation. It constantly is going to be challenging people to understand what they believe and why they believe those things. It reminds me of the quote by Carl Jung, the psychologist that said, until you make the unconscious conscious, you will call it fate and it will direct your life. And so growth mindset oftentimes starts with an understanding of where do I want to grow or where do I need to grow? And then being open to the challenges that lead to that. This book helps by poking <laughs> a lot of times at people in different ways to be able to hopefully expose some of those places of potential growth. And in terms of emotional intelligence, you know, for, for decades now, that's been one of the top, top traits that leaders need to continuously practice. And a lot of emotional intelligence comes around self-awareness as well as empathy and understanding of how others are in situations. And so the book creates a lot of opportunities as well as alternative points of view from all walks of life that will hopefully help people start to understand other perspectives and again, continue to reflect and be more self-aware of their own. Don't be afraid to examine your own beliefs, say them out loud so we all know what they are and, and there's no ambiguity about it. And don't be afraid to challenge those from time to time and, and have this abundance mindset and growth mindset. I really I so appreciate those lessons, Joshua, that, and many more that come throughout your book. Who do you think this book is written for? Yeah, the, the audience is really anybody in business. I think it will especially resonate with managers and leaders of people. But in the early talks I've given on the book, it's resonated across the board from frontline employees to anybody. Uh, but it will be primarily people who are interested in business as well as how business is done and why business is done. It'll be extremely interesting to people who already have a bent towards using business for good. So as I mentioned before, people who are already curious or interested in conscious capitalism, stakeholder capitalism, benefit corporations, you know, the continued advancement of social justice or a number of other um, uh, ideas in the workplace, people who are interested in the future of work, and probably anybody who is a um, more strategic or critical thinker who likes to be challenged a bit and, and is already on a path towards a growth mindset. It's not for people who are already stuck in the ways of this is the way the business has to be done. And, and I think there's already some other great books that are out there that show the hard numbers and the hard ROI of, of why conscious capitalism, for instance, is a good choice. But as I was exploring this book concept with a couple of my mentors, I kind of said there's already enough of those types of books that are out there. And if people are going to be on this train, they're already on it now or not. And so this book is about helping those people who are already on the train or someone who's on the train, helping grab some of their other team members or other leaders onto the train with them. That is fantastic. I love this. You keep coming back to this idea of business being able to do good for others, both the team, the employees, the client, customers all across the board. And, you know, this, this ripple effect really is such a big deal. One of my early mentors said to me, as I was trying to figure out my career, he said, you know, good begets good. 
Go help somebody else out and yes. good things will happen. And you mentioned karma as well. I, I often think of karma as a boomerang, right? What we throw out there is, is going to come flying back to us. And, and uh, you know, if it's not a good thing, it might hurt on the way back, right? <laughs> and, and so thinking about this book, The Journey, you've done so much growth and, and thinking and reflection on yourself. You know, how, how has this book continued to help you evolve your learning about yourself along the way? It, you know, it's been a great lesson in discipline. I'm someone who has survived a lot of my life on being able to be really good in the moment, spontaneous, improvising. But I would say this and starting piano lessons a couple of years ago were two of my greatest lessons in the importance of discipline. And so I've definitely continued to learn more about myself and, and how that balance is helpful in being able to push something like this over the finish line. Incredible. Having that uh, that focus, that that w- willing to commit and work through it. What do you think learning the piano has taught you about your business? That right, if, I always find it fascinating when someone delves into a right brain exercise, like something creative. And what what does that learn? What has that helped you with? It, it, you know what? It it a great example is you know I was doing recitals every six months. And by my limit, I, I wasn't a kid who who you know played piano as a kid. I played bass guitar later on high school, college and beyond, but never did anything on piano. So at the recitals, I was next to the six to eight year olds, maybe eventually the eight to 10 year olds. And I was nervous as all get out. If you see any of these videos of me, I am shaking uncontrollably up there. And the greatest lesson that it taught me was I had to put in so much practice to get up to that recital point so I could get up there because I blacked out <laughs> and then played my piece and then was done and was like, okay, are we done? And that isn't like how I can do most of the rest of, of my facilitation or speeches or other things where I can get up there and be in the moment and improvise and feel the energy of the crowd and go with it. Like it, as you said, it activated a very different part of, of my skills. And so it was a, it was a good lesson that was learned through that about the importance of practice and discipline. And to tie it back to the writing program, it was one of the greatest parts of this writing program was just very early on getting us into the discipline of writing 500 words, writing 100 words, writing 1500 words. You know, one, one of the greatest pieces of advice that Eric Custer shared early on when I was saying, what, what is our book? We're supposed to have a table of contents. We're supposed to have a summary. I'm, I'm, what, what's going on? He, he kind of paused and he said, before you can connect the dots. You need to have the dots. And it was oh, it was a brilliant, brilliant point. And it was trusting the discipline of creating your dots. And eventually, you know, 90, 95% of what I wrote ended up being in the book. So the lesson of discipline, not only in piano as, as well as writing, was important. That is amazing. Uh, Joshua, dare to be naive. What is the key message you hope listeners, readers take away from the, the book? Yet the key message, you have to understand a secret about the book, and that is that the word naive has actually been hijacked. Our ancestors didn't use the word naive the way that you and I do. It actually had a positive to a neutral connotation up until a few hundred years ago. And before that time, all it meant was natural or innate or that thing which was in you from the start. And so when when I ask the dare to be naive or, or coming back to naivete, it's it's a rediscovery, right? A discovering or an uncovering of that which was already in you from the start, and you're just making more space for it again. And that's the key message that I hope people take away from this book is, again, to understand that they are innately good, that they have it within them to do what they want to, and especially to do good in business and life, and that really they just need to create the space for that to be able to flourish and and be all right to just get started on that. Unbelievable. I had no idea that that word had been hijacked for centuries now and you're bringing it back. I really appreciate that and what you've done to help us think differently about business and the impact we have on others around us and how that can change things with this concept of this ripple effect. What a powerful message. What's been an unexpected positive for you in this journey? Sure. An unexpected positive from this journey has been just the amount of encouragement and support that I've received from the people around me. As I mentioned before, I'm typically reluctant to ask for help or to promote. And so once this book went into pre-order and and sharing it, the people who stepped up and said, what can I do to help you has been great. Again, my friend Diana, we mentioned it. I was telling her that I was feeling a little bit lazy because because there's plenty of people in this cohort who are you know sending out all these emails and all of these posts and they're doing all of these things. 
And sorry, John, I did not do a bunch of that stuff. I, I you know, casually and, and with intent talked to close networks and, and, and worked through some of those things. And Diana reminded me, she said, there's a lot of people who are doing a lot of hard work right now. You've been doing hard work over the last 10 to 20 years of helping people and being genuine and authentic. And that's what's showing up in spades right now. And so that has been an amazing positive just to remember that there are people out there who want to help and that they appreciate the work that we've been able to do for the last couple of decades. And speaking of this karma concept, right? It's been this karma coming back to you, this positive energy you've put out in the world for so many years now and helping others has come back to you and helping you get this book off the ground and create these new opportunities for you and your business. That is fantastic. So Joshua, what's next for you? What are some of the goals with the book? Yeah, goals for the book. We'll be launching it this spring. We will, it'll be in paperback, then we'll do hardcover. We'll do the audiobook. Already thinking about speaking tours. We already have about a dozen companies lined up to be able to go do talks with their employees. And so I think the, the next several months are going to be a lot of fun as we get to continue to share this message with people. Um, and then we're starting to have conversations with our internal team at Econic about how they can continue to make some of this content even more accessible and actionable for those organizations and teams who want to continue to use some of the things that are in the book to practice for themselves how to be more authentic as well as to have better business results. For a guy who's had this enormous lifetime of growth mindset, it's Awesome to see you continue to push on that with the book, your business, helping your team members grow and so many around you. So appreciate your message. Joshua, if people want to learn more about you and your book, where might they go? Sure. Best spot would be to go to the website for the book, which is daretobenaive.com. They can also find me on LinkedIn, again, under Joshua Berry, or people are going to always just email me directly at josh at econic, that's E-C-O-N-I-C dot co. Barry with an E. Thank you for that. One quick quote I want to share, an early praise quote you got from a gentleman you referenced a couple of times, Chip Connolly, about the book. Uh, the wise leader moves beyond either or thinking and begins to embrace more of the both and. Through compelling stories, best pract uh, practices, and provocative questions, Joshua creates space for leaders to explore their emerging wisdom. Wow. How did that feel to get that quote from Mr. Connolly? It was wonderful. I mean, he's, he's an individual that I've admired in, in so many ways. He himself is a New York Times bestselling author and, you know, really some would credit with founding the boutique hotel industry and then helping Airbnb and then now reinventing himself again with the modern elder academy. It, it was, it was wonderful. And the support of, of Chip and a lot of other mentors and leaders throughout this time has been phenomenal. There have been lots of other great endorsements and praise early on so far. So I'm excited for people to be able to get to read this. So, so cool. Joshua, thank you for joining this show, the creator community, sharing your story with us. And thank you for making this concept of being naive, very accessible, and really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. John, I appreciate it. This was a lot of fun, just like you promised. That I speculated. <laughs> speculated is going to be fun. And you delivered, John. There we go. Joshua Berry's book, Dare to be Naive, will be available this spring 2023, wherever you buy books online. Don't forget to subscribe to the Creator Community channel on your favorite podcast platform, and be sure to leave us a review. If you're ready to write your book, visit manuscripts.com <clears throat> to learn how to turn your idea into a book in about 12 to 15 months. I'm your host of the creator community, John Saunders. Keep creating.